All right, I want to finish up the rest of the energy notes. And just to give you an idea of, of where we are, okay, that was the last page. We had had a um, person comes down a ramp. There was a spring that they compressed. Okay, we found the length of spring was compressed. So right after that, okay, we look at the concept of power. All right, so, so we talked about the concept of work. So let's say something lifts this mass up and does a certain amount of work. Okay, so just like maybe where you work, um, your boss might have a certain job for you to do, a certain amount of work to be done. Okay, well, it depends whether they want that work done over the next 15 minutes or over the next three weeks. So power, concept of power, is the rate at which work is done. Okay, so think of power is not only the rate at which work is done, and remember the definition of work is the transfer of energy, so power is the rate at which energy is transferred by that force, okay? So you can think of you have a force, okay? And that force, in the old chapter we'd say it would accelerate something, but now we say that force can change the energy. So the power, okay, due to an applied force is the rate at which that force transfers energy. So not only do we wanna know how much energy is being transferred, we want to know the rate at which that is being done. So that's the concept of power. Okay. So first thing we look at is the concept of average power. Okay. So if I have a force and does a certain amount of work over some period of time, the average power due to that force is the work done divided by the time it took that work to be done. But when we started the chapter, we said work okay, is energy being transferred. Okay. So for an example, here's an object you drop. Gravity does work. Remember, the work done by gravity decreases the potential energy, but it increases the kinetic energy. Okay, So think of that as energy is being transferred. So you have potential energy being transferred from the ball, or the ball in Earth system, to the kinetic energy of the ball. So the, the average power is the rate at which that's occurring. Okay, So if you look at the units of power, okay, power is the rate at which work is done. Okay, and work is a transfer of energy, so it's energy per time. And energy has units of joules, and our SI unit of time is second. So a joule per second is called a watt. All right, now, here's the confusing thing. In this chapter, we're going to have W that can stand for three things. We had W for work, we had W for weight, and now we have W for watt. So you just have to watch the context of the W. Maybe sometimes you might want maybe either write W like that, okay? or you can just write out the word watts. Okay, so a watt is a joule per second, right? Now, to give you an idea what one watt of power is, okay, or what it means for a force to produce or deliver one watt of power. Okay, so here's you. You have a one liter of water, which has a mass of a kilogram, right? And you're going to lift this by about three feet. Okay, so here it's at rest. You're going to lift it up here and stop, so it's going to be at rest, all right? So potential energy at the floor is zero, and to make the numbers look nice, I'm going to use G as 10. So you lift your, your one liter of water bottle, okay, and you could do that over a period of a couple hours, lift it slowly, or you could lift it rapidly. So here you're going to lift it in one second. So you're going to do a certain amount of work, okay, to lift it, which means you're going to give it potential energy, but you're going to do that in one second. So the average power required to do that, okay, now the average power means it's the power that this force is able to provide, okay, and the, power, the force comes from your hand, so it's the average power that you have to deliver or produce to be able to lift that in one second. So average power is work per time, okay, and the work done by you, okay, we can think about it as force times a distance, but just think about it as the work done by you changes the potential energy. So the final potential energy up here is just mgh. So there's the mass. Okay, I'm using gravity as 10. Okay, you left, lifted about three feet, that's a meter, and you did that over a period of time of a second. So the average power okay, produced by you, okay, remember that's the rate at which your hand force did work, is 10 joules per second, and a joule per second is a watt. So you generated 10 watts to lift your one liter of water 
three feet. Okay, so that gives you an idea of what one watt is because you produced ten watts just to do that. Okay, now, so <clears throat> another way of looking at average power, we just said it's work per time, all right, and work, all right. We had, remember work, this is for something moving to the horizontal, so you have an applied force. So work is the component of the force along the direction you're going times the distance to which that force moves. So when we started the concept of work in one dimension, we thought about it as it's that component of the force times the direction, the x direction through which it moves. So I wrote that here. Okay, so for work, I put in that. Okay, but the distance x divided by the time, okay, that distance divided by time, that's the average velocity. So another way to look at the average power is not just energy per time, but it's the force, okay, in one direction. So it's the component of the force on the direction it's going times the average velocity. So for example, here I have a car. I have a force that's propelling the car, so the engine provides that, okay, that turns the tires. So if you're watching this over here, okay, the car is accelerating to the right. So that means there has to be a net force on it to the right. So that's the force that I'm representing there. So the average power that that force produces to accelerate that car is the work it does per time. And that's this expression here, okay? So it's the force times the average velocity. So here's the force. Okay. There's your average velocity. And remember, definition of work ha had a, a dot product. So you have the cosine of the angle between, between the force and the direction it's going, which is zero degrees. So your average power, right there, is your force times your average velocity. Okay. So you can either think about the average power as the work done per time, or if you're given the force and the average velocity, that would also give you the average power. Okay, so this concept here, okay, that the average power is the force times the average velocity, that would work, let's say, in this semester in terms of mechanics. So you can see the car has a force. Next semester, in 196, when you do electricity, you might have a battery. It's attached to a light bulb. Okay, maybe that's a 100-watt light bulb, okay, or a 10-watt light bulb. And it makes more sense to talk about the average power that's, um, produced to light up the light bulb, or the average power required um, for the light bulb, is the energy per time. So that light bulb consumes energy. Okay, so for a hundred watt light bulb, you know that the light bulb gets hot. Okay, compared to a ten a ten watt light bulb. So it doesn't make sense to to look at the power generated to light up the light bulb in terms of a force times an average velocity. That doesn't have much context here. So it's better to think about as power for light bulb is energy consumption per time, okay? Or like for an appliance. Okay, there's your toaster. There's your bread popping out of the toaster, okay? So you look on the back of the toaster, it might say this toaster needs a 1,000 watts to run, okay? So you can think of energy per time, but it doesn't make sense to think of force times an average velocity. So for mechanics, you can think about it in two ways. You have work per time or an average force, whoops, or a force times an average velocity. Okay, now that was an average, that was the average power that that force produces, meaning the rate at which that force transfer, transfers energy. Okay, that was average power. So you have a force times an average velocity or the work done over that period of time, right? Now, the instantaneous power, okay, so there's no, there's no borrow over the, the, uh, the symbol P. So the instantaneous power is the, the, is the rate at which energy is being transferred at that instant, okay? Or it's the instantaneous rate at which that force does work, okay? So power is the rate at which work is done. Okay, so I wrote this as a differential element of work. Okay, so it's a rate at which work is done. Okay, so that part is the rate, d by dt, of the work. Okay, but we know the definition of work is integral of f dot ds. So if I take a differential of both sides of this, if I take a differential of both sides of that, on the left side I get that. If I take a differential of the integral, 
Okay, it, undo, it undoes the integral. Okay. So here, on the right side, I have, when I undo the integral, I have f dot ds. But this right here, okay, ds dt, that's the velocity. The rate of change of position is velocity. Okay, so the average power was the force times the average velocity. The instantaneous power, that instantaneous power due to the force, so meaning if you have a car traveling over the road, and at this instant, I want to know what's the power at that instant, I would take the force dotted into the velocity at that instant. So if there's no bar over it, then that denotes the power at some instant, which means you need to know the force, but you need to know the velocity at that instant. Okay, so here's an example of trying to calculate the average, per, uh, average power produced by a force. So I have a car. It's at rest, the initial is zero, okay? And I know the mass of the car, and there, this force, so that would be the net force on the car, and it accelerates the car for five seconds. Okay, so I, so I have, it has a constant acceleration, so that means I would have a constant force from Newton's law, and I want to find the average, average power produced by that force, okay? Well, my average power is my force times my average velocity, okay? Well, what's the force? Well, F is ma, and I know the mass, and I know the acceleration, so that's done. So I need to find the average velocity. So I go back to chapter two. Average velocity is displacement over time. So I went to equation number two. Okay, initial velocity is zero. So my displacement is one half a t squared. And I know a and I know t. So I, calc so I put in for a and I put in for t, and I got my displacement. So my average velocity is displacement over time. So I put in my displacement per time. And then that gives you my average velocity. So the average power produced by that force is the given force, which is ma, times the average velocity I found. Okay, and then I just converted that to kilowatts. All right, so that's what it means to find an, an average power. Okay, if you wanted the power um, at some instant, then you would have to take that known force, which we know, we know the force and number, and then whatever particular instant you want, you'd have to know the velocity at that instant. And that would give you your average, that would give you your instantaneous power that that force is producing. Okay, here's another example of a power problem. All right, so let's say you buy a piano and it doesn't fit through the front door. So you realize they have to uh, deliver it with a crane and then push it into your window. Okay, so I know the weight of the piano. Let's say you're on the eighth floor, and the delivery company doesn't want to be there all day. They want to be able to deliver that piano, raise it up in four minutes. So what's the minimum power that the motor on the crane has to be able to deliver or produce? Okay, so the average power, I should say the, the minimum power, is the work it has to do divided by the time. Okay, so the piano starts here at rest, and it's going to lift it up here at rest. So if I choose my potential energy to be zero at the ground, okay, so the work done by the, the cable to lift it up, the work done goes into increasing its potential energy. So when the piano is up here, potential energy is mgh, okay, and I know the time. So remember, mg is given a 6,000, that's the height. And my four minutes is 240 seconds. So on the top, my units on the top are Newton meters. My units on the bottom are seconds. A Newton meter is a joule, and a joule per second is a watt. Okay, so that's the minimum power that that motor has to have. Now, um, if I'm going to convert that to a unit called horsepower. So look in the back of the book, they say that one horsepower is about seven, 746 watts. So if you go online to Wikipedia and type in horse, horsepower, you'll see all different types of horsepower conversions to watts. So there's electric horsepower, there's a thermal horsepower. Okay, So you'll see some books will say one horsepower is approximately 746 watts. So I just converted that. Okay, So I get about one. So essentially, 
the minimum power that that motor has to have is about one horsepower. So let's say the truck showed up and it had a motor that was three quarter horsepower. Okay, could that truck deliver the piano? Okay, yeah, it could, but what would be different? Right, it would take longer. It wouldn't be able to do it in four minutes, it would take a longer amount of time. So that's the concept of power. Okay, same amount of work is being done. Okay, but this truck wants to be able to do it quickly, so the minimum power requirement is one horsepower 750 watts to deliver that in four minutes. All right. Now, as part of the global consciousness and global awareness component of the course, okay, I want to ask, what do you purchase from SDG&E, San Diego Gas and Electric? So I'm taking out the G. I don't care about the gas part. All right. So as a good consumer, you want to know, what are you being billed for? So the electric bill, they bill you for so many uh, they bill you so many cents for each of this, okay? And that's a kilowatt hour. So the K is kilo. That's a watt times hour. So a kilowatt hour. So I want to figure out what is a kilowatt hour? Well, the kilo is just a unit. A uh, kilo is just the multiplier. So I want to look at a watt hour. What is a watt hour? Okay. Well, watt is a unit of power. Okay. So a kilowatt hour is power times time. So power times time. But power, whoops, power is energy times time. So the times cancel and I wind up with energy. So a kilowatt hour is a unit, whoops, a kilowatt hour is a unit of energy. So they're charging you so much, so many cents, okay, for energy. All right. So even though they bill you for energy, or oh, the reason they bill you for energy Okay, not powers. They don't care how fast you use it. They just want to know each month how much you use. Okay, like the water company. They don't charge you in gallons per second. They charge you in terms of how many gallons you use for the whole month. Okay, so even though they bill you for energy, they're still responsible for power. Because let's say you have a microwave or a toaster or a hair dryer. Okay, those things might have a label on them that says that they need a thousand watts. Okay. So that means a thousand watts is a thousand joules per second. So if you buy a okay, thousand joules and it's delivered through the, through the electrical line, okay, how fast do you want that thousand joules delivered? Okay, you don't want it trickling in over a period of a week. You want that thousand joules delivered every second. Otherwise, your light, your uh, microwave won't work. Okay, your toaster won't get hot. Okay, if you have a hundred watt light bulb. Okay, that, that, oops, 100 watts, that's 100 joules per second. So that 100 joules has to be de delivered to the light bulb each second, otherwise the light bulb won't get very bright. Okay, all right, so the whole idea is, is yeah, they bill you for energy, but they're responsible for delivering it quickly. So they're responsible for providing power, but they bill you for the energy. Okay. So I think this is uh, I think this is a homework problem as well, all right, or similar to a homework problem. Okay, so here I have a tar here I have Tarzan. Give me the weight of Tarzan standing on the cliff, okay, holding a vine, and they give me the height that they fall through. Okay, and I want to know will the vine break? And they tell me the vine will break at that tension. Right. And then I had to add that, assume that he starts from rest here at the cliff and swings down to here. Okay, so we have to figure out where is the tension going to be the biggest to figure out whether or not the vine's going to break. Okay, where is the tension the, the biggest? Well, we could probably argue the tension's probably biggest at the bottom as he swings back and forth. So what I did is I just chose some arbitrary place like over here, and I drew him swinging at that spot. Okay, so Tarzan is right there, right? And I want to find the tension. So that, that's a five-step method. So I need to calculate the tension okay, at that spot. So I do my forces on Tarzan. So I have the tension and the string, and I have his weight. Okay, so my picture, my forces, coordinate system. Well, the coordinate system is based on the direction of acceleration, and he's accelerating toward the center of the circle. That's the direction of my acceleration. So that dictates my coordinate system. Here's my x-axis. There's my y-axis, all right? So that says I had to break up mg. So if this is the angle theta. That's my angle theta. So this is mg cosine. That's mg sine, 
and I put two lines through that to remind myself I've broken it up. Okay, And then I apply F equal MA in the centripetal direction. So I have T points inward, MG, points, MG cosine points away, and that's equal to MB squared over L, because he's moving in a circle of radius L. So L is the length of the vine. Okay, so I solved this for T. All right. So this is the tension at any place when he's swinging. So I have to figure out where is the tension the biggest. Okay. So I have to figure out what what about okay, well what are the constants? So mass is a constant, g is a constant, length of the vine is a constant. So the only variables are theta and v. Okay. Well, the biggest that cosine theta gets is one. Okay. So that's the biggest when theta is zero degrees, cosine zero is one. So that's at the bottom, okay, when he's at the very bottom here. Okay, so that makes cosine theta the biggest, all right? Well, where is the speed the biggest, all right? Well, as it turns out, the speed is the biggest also at the bottom, okay? Now let's argue why that is. So let's say he starts here and he's swinging back and forth. So he's at rest here and he's at rest here, all right? So with respect to where he started, all the energy is potential here, gravitational potential energy here. Then it's all kinetic here. It's all potential when he comes up to this height, comes back here, all, all kinetic, all potential, all kinetic, all potential. Okay, so all of the energy, okay, is kinetic at the bottom. So that means his speed is the biggest at the bottom, all right? And we already looked at springs a little bit, so I kind of projected this image down Look, look at a mass on a spring, and we'll see in the future when we get to chapter 15 that if this spring oscillates between these two points, okay, the mass is at rest on the ends, okay, just like we already did. Um, uh, we, we did uh, Hooke's Law spring force. So if it's at rest at the ends, that means it has to pass through a maximum at the middle, and that's what Tarzan's doing. Okay, so the speed is the biggest at the bottom. So that says that the tension is the biggest at the bottom. So I read you the same picture, oops, but now I put him at the bottom. Okay, so here's Tarzan at the bottom, and I want to find that speed at the bottom. I want to find the tension first at the bottom. So a picture, forces, coordinate system, okay, coordinate system is based on the acceleration. So here I'm not drawing x and y, I'm just doing this in the centripetal direction. I don't need the x direction. So I have t points up, mg points down, and that's equal to mv squared over l, where l is the radius of the circle. So this gives me the tension. And if I, if I compare this one to this one, okay, this is what I have. Because up here I had mg cosine theta. Well, you're at zero degrees, so cosine theta is one. Okay, there's my one. And I have mv squared over l. So mv squared over l. So this is, oops, this is the tension at the bottom, all right? So I need to find V, okay? Now that becomes an energy problem. So I go to, well, I use our go-to energy expression, okay? Where this term energy lost is the energy lost due to kinetic friction. Well, there's no kinetic friction. That term is zero, okay? So I have to look at this term, work done by non-conservative forces, okay? Are there any non-conservative forces that act on Tarzan? Yeah, the tension. That's a non-conservative force. There is no potential energy function associated with, with the tension. Well, as he swings back and forth, okay, the tension is always perpendicular to the direction he's going. Okay, remember, work has that dot product in there. Okay, so think of ds as that's the direction of ds. Okay, it's in the direction of the arc at that instant. So the force, the tension force, is always perpendicular to the direction he's headed at that instant. Okay, so even though there is a non-conservative force, it does no work. So that term is now zero. So therefore, energy doesn't change. Okay, so final minus initial is zero. So that says energy is conserved. So I read you the same picture. Here's where we started on the cliff. So I'm going from A to B. So I, I wrote each energy term, potential plus kinetic. So here's my reference point at the lowest point. So initial potential energy is mgh. Kinetic zero could start it from rest. Final potential is zero at the bottom. Final kinetic at the 
bottom with my one half mb squared. Okay, mass of Tarzan drops out, so that gives me speed squared at the bottom. The reason I left it as speed squared is because I needed to pop it in to the tension. So I'm putting in for v squared right there. Okay, and then I factored out mg. All right, and then I looked up above and I got the the weight of Tarzan. That's the height. Okay, the length of the vine is 15 meters. So this gives me the tension of the vine at the bottom. But uh, but in the the problem, okay, the maximum tension, whoops, was 1112. So we found that the tension at the bottom is 1077, which is less than the breaking strength of the vine. Therefore, the vine doesn't break.